Hello everyone, my name is Anton Pelcher. I'm an engineer and I have been constructing fish farms for more than 10 years. Today we will talk about a very interesting topic, it's palms used in rare systems. What are they and how do they work? How to choose the right palm? How not to commit serious mistakes that will result in fish death? And how to save energy and water circulation in grass? All this and much more you will see in this video, so be sure to watch it to the end, because firstly, I will tell you about top 5 mistakes when selecting a pump, and secondly, at the end of the video, I will tell about a special bonus that you can download, get and use to select pumps for your REST system. Let's go! Did you know that the water in REST is used about 200 times? Imagine, 200 times the water in the fish tanks gets dirty and contaminated, is treated by the filters and returned back to the tanks, and this process is permanent and uninterrupted 24 hours a day. Yes, of course, 5-10% of water is additionally supplied to the system in the form of makeup water and is lost for flushing the filters, but nevertheless, the entire main volume of water is constantly being circulated and is used many times. So, how do you ensure that the water is constantly being circulated in the system? That's what pumps are used for in RAS. How do pumps operate? It's very simple. The water in the fish tanks gets contaminated, that is, fish eat, fish excrete feces, plus the remains of an eaten feed, and so on. The water gets dirty, it's drained through the pipes and enters water treatment system. After passing through certain filters, water flows by gravity to the lowest point of the system. The lowest point of the system may be located after the drum filter or after the biofilter, or at some other point, if it's some type of a non-standard REST system. So, from this lowest point, the water must be returned back to REST. This is where the pumps are installed and they operate for constant water circulation in the system. Let's talk about three major characteristics of pumps. The first is the water flow rate. Well, what is the water flow rate? This is how many cubic meters per hour or liters per second or liters per minute pass through the system. This is how much water the pump can pump and deliver to where it's needed. For example, there is one pump that can pump 10 cubic meters per hour, another pump that can pump 100 cubic meters per hour, and the third pump that can pump 500 cubic meters per hour. These are different pumps in terms of water flow rate. The second main characteristic is head or pressure. Both are about the same. It's no longer measured in cubic meters per hour, but either in meters or in bars, whichever you prefer. One bar is equal 10 meters of water column, and this is the characteristic that tells how high the pump can lift water. For example, one propeller pump raises water to 2 to 3 meters. The second pump, some started centrifugal pump, raises water to, let's say, 10 meters. And some high-pressure pump, used as a flushing pump, can raise water to 100 meters. So the head is the characteristic, which is also very important to consider when selecting a pump. And the third very important characteristic is its power consumption. That is, how much energy the pump consumes when it operates. This is very important, because we are planning our business, we are counting money, so it's essential to consider how much electricity the pump consumes. Let's talk about the pump operating point. So what is the operating point? To make it somehow easier for you to compare, Imagine a person who can lift a barbell weighing, let's say, 100 kilograms, if he will stand firmly on his feet and without moving. At the same time, the same person can run at 20 km per hour without lifting any weight. But if you give this person a 100 kg barbell and tell him to run at 20 km per hour, of course, he will not be able to. For example, he can run with a barbell of, let's imagine, 50 kg at 10 km per hour speed or with a barbell of 60 kg at something around 5 km per hour speed. So that's what I'm talking about. There is the maximum head of the pump and there is the maximum flow of the pump. Why did I make this analogy? Every pump has an operation chart with flow on one axis and head on the other axis. The curve of the pump operation is downward. 
that is, the higher the flow of the pump, the lower the head of pressure is. And the lower the flow, the higher the pressure. Therefore, the pump is an operating point. The pump will never operate at either the minimum flow or the maximum head. Well, at least it's unprofitable. That is, your pump will provide 10% of what it can and will be overflown. Why is it when there is another pump which can solve this problem? And the second, the pump never runs at maximum flow. Imagine, you turn on the pump at free spout and it flails at full flow. The pump never works like that either, because in RAS it delivers water to the system of pipelines which have a certain resistance. Therefore, the operating point of the pump is set somewhere in the middle. To be more precise, in the third quarter of the chart, which is about 50 to 70 percent of the maximum pump capacity. What does that tell you? It at this point, about 70 percent of the maximum capacity of the maximum pump flow rate. That is the optimal point as the pump operates with maximum efficiency. So, what am I talking about now? What it does mean to you? If the pump has a maximum flow of 100 cubic meters per hour, then keep in mind that in reality you will not run it at more than 70 cubic meters, well, maximum 80 cubic meters per hour. And this I just want to state the first of my top 5 mistakes which other people often make. Wrong selection of the flow rate. That is, you look at the nameplate of the pump or its specification and you see the maximum flow of let's say 200 cubic meters per hour. And you think, ok, I have a water flow of 200 cubic meters, it's fine, I will give that to maximum. And what happens in reality? In reality, this pump will work at 70% of this maximum capacity. Its operating point will shift along the curve and you will get 140 cubic meters per hour instead of 200 cubic meters per hour. So keep in mind, if you need the real capacity of 200 cubic meters per hour, you need a pump that has a maximum operating capacity of 260 to 300 cubic meters per hour. Every single pump has its own and unique operation curve that virtually no other pump follows. This curve or operation chart is tested at the factory that produces that pump, and any manufacturer will always provide you a head pressure chart for almost any pump. Analyzing that chart, you can find the very operating point with the right pressure and the right flow rate. By the way, I'll talk about the head pressure a little later. And we continue. What's next? What types of pumps are generally used at rice farms? In fact, there is a great number of pumps types. There are piston pumps, plunger pumps, centrifugal pumps. Well, there are quite a lot of types, alternatives, and moreover, modifications and models. I will tell you about those that are most commonly used in our rice systems, because we are talking about them today. The first type is the centrifugal pump. This pump is installed on a dry side is connected by a pipeline to the pump tank and returns water to the fish tanks. It is a standard impeller. All in all, it's the most widely used pump in fish farming systems. The second type is the submersible pump. In fact, it is a similar principle of operation. The impeller which rotates from the electric motor, but is completely immersed in the water. That is, you install it in the pump tank or by filter, it intakes water from the tank. It doesn't need any external connections. It pumps water through a pipe into the fish tanks. The next type is the propeller pump. What is a propeller pump? It's a large long tube with a rod and propeller at the bottom. An electric motor is located on top, the electric motor rotates the rod and propeller, the propeller takes the water in, raises it to a small height and supplies it further to the systems. It tends to have high costs, very high efficiency, low power consumption. And the last pump type is the high pressure pump. As a rule, such pumps are used for the drum filter flushing, because in order to effectively flush in the mesh, you need 7 bar pressure or 70 meters head. And that's what high pressure pumps are used for. They usually have a small flow rate from 2 to 5 cubic meters per hour at most, but they splash water at a very high pressure, knocking the dart off the drum filter mesh. Let's talk about pump reliability. Imagine you have a rest system with a capacity of 10 tons of sturgeon, with a total grow out fish value of, for example, almost 150,000 US dollars. And then your pump fails. 
the whole system stops and you have only 30 minutes to start the system again before a fish die. And just compare, the cost of the pump that failed is only, let's say, 500 US dollars. What do you think? Is it worth saving on a backup pump? Personally, I think it's not worth. And let's talk about which types of pumps there are in terms of reliability. First, there are pumps for domestic needs. You can find them at online stores. These are pumps that are used at country houses, cottages, some small ponds. There are a lot of these pumps, mostly Chinese. The next type of pumps are semi-industrial pumps. As a rule, these are pumps used at swimming pool. A whole bunch of brands of pumps and models are used for swimming pools. In the swimming pools, if the circulation stops, water treatment system fails, by and large nothing critical will happen, at least no one will die. Therefore, the pumps of average reliability are installed there. Generally, they can be used for rest systems too, but I would recommend to install them at small farms only. If conditionally domestic pumps are used only for conditionally homemade systems, the next semi-industrial pumps are already installed at small-scale commercial fish farms. They are produced by the following brands – Asper, Aquaviva, Spec, Sachi, Crispol. Well, there are a lot of brands. All of them are either Chinese or European. And the third type is industrial pumps. They are as reliable as possible, have all necessary seals and absolutely different quality of assembly, metal quality, and they are usually used in the most efficient and reliable systems. I try to use them and recommend this type of pumps. What brands exist in this category? Generally, as I said, these are Willow, Grandfos, Pedrello, Calpeta. Of course, these brands are world-known, large-scale brands. They have their own line of domestic pumps distributed in the countries of brand origin. But we don't take them into account. If we consider the industrial versions, Pedrello pumps are highly reliable, work for years and almost do not fail or break down. What pumps do I use at the farms that my company designs and constructs? As I have already mentioned, I recommended the latest pumps type. Industrial ones, mainly I use Pedrello and Willow brands. In my opinion, they are the best in terms of price-quality ratio. I use centrifugal pumps, not submersible. Submersible are also good enough, but the model range is rather scarce. It's almost impossible to find the right pump, and even more so from the stock. I don't like them much because they don't have such a great model range, such prices, such energy efficiency as centrifugal pumps. By the way, which pumps do you trust more? Which ones do you use? Be sure to write it in the comments. I'm very interested to learn your experience and your opinion. How do you choose a pump for your rest farm? As I said earlier, the pump has two main characteristics – head and flow. We will not mention the brands now. I've already told you about that – the types of pumps. For example, you have a system with a water exchange of 100 cubic meters per hour. Let's start with the flow rate. You need a pump that will provide either 100 cubic meters per hour at the operating point. I stress at the operating point. Or you may prefer to use two pumps, 50 cubic meters per hour each. If you use three pumps, each will have the capacity of 35 cubic meters per hour. Then you connect several pumps in parallel, and they together give you the flow rate you need. So, if you need a pump for 100 cubic meters per hour in the operating point, then you pick up a pump with a maximum flow of 130 to 150 cubic meters per hour. Or better yet, study the pump operation chart. The second parameter is the head. What kind of head is really needed in RAS? I will say that the head may be different depending on your approach to the layout. From 2 or 3 meters and up to 10 15 meters, that up to 1.5 bar. Well, for example, in the pressure count standard uses, as a rule, the pressure of 1 bar. That is, your pump should provide 10 meters at the operating point. In low pressure systems, 5 to 6 meters, that is about half a bar. Propeller pumps in general give 3 to 4 meters, which is equivalent to 0.3 to 0.4 bar. That's for the systems where it's not necessary to create any pressure at all and just lift water. Everything that's less than half a meter ejects are used, but that's a separate story. And by the way, here lies the second mistake, a very important one that I would like to mention. It's the wrong selection of the pump in terms of pressure. Very often I encountered the cases when in order to perform elementary pumping of water to some small height without creating pressure, a pump with a head off, for example, one and a half or two bars is used. 
Sure, it certainly works, but it requires as much power as four pumps with low pressure. That's why a pump is often too powerful or incapable to perform. I have often seen, so to say, weak pumps used for flash and drum filters. That's a pump with pressure of 2 to 3 bars, which doesn't flush the mesh normally. The mesh is constantly clogged, flushing is constantly in the operation mode, and such a pump will never work effectively in this particular situation. So, choose the right pump, select the right pressure. By the way, how do you select the right head of pressure of the pump? The required pressure depends on three factors. The first one is the pressure in the oxygenator. The pressure that you need to create in order to saturate the water with the oxygen in the required quantity. The second is the geometric water lift height, that is, how high you need to raise the water. That is, the difference between the water surface, the water level at the lowest point in the system where the pumps will intake water, and the highest point in the system where you need to pump water to. And the third thing is the pipe's resistance. Your piping system has a certain amount of friction. The higher the water flow rate is, the higher the velocity of the water is, the more resistance is created in the same pipe. So be sure to consider all three factors when selecting the required pump pressure. Where are the pumps installed? You have selected the pump by flow, by head, everything is cool. Where to connect it? Everything is very simple. The pump is installed at the lowest point of the system. For example, the water from your fish tanks flows by gravity to the drum filter, and the water should be supplied there only by gravity. Then, if the drum filter is at the lowest point, there is a pump tank following it, and pumps are connected to this pump tank and taking water from there. The second option is a biofilter installed after the drum filter. Water is also supplied to it by gravity, but it's located even lower, and then the pump tank is installed after the biofilter. And by the way, I want to mention the third and very important mistake, which is committed quite often. I would not even say that it's a mistake, but in my opinion, it's an inappropriate waste of money on electricity. Electricity. It's when water is lifted by pumps twice. For example, first the pumps after the drum filter raise water to the biofilter. Then from the biofilter water flows into another pump tank, from which the pumps intake water again and then supply it to the oxygenator and then to fish tanks. This is done because it's impossible to feed water from the biofilter to pressure oxygenator by gravity. That's why water is lifted twice. I'm not the proponent of such solutions. I always try to make it so that water is pumped only once, because two water lifts means double energy consumption. Pumps are most often one of the most energy-consuming equipment units in REST system. Why ever pay when you can provide for only one water lift with a proper system design? Next, pump installation and piping. So, we realized that after the biofilter we need to install and connect the pump. How to implement that? It may cause problems. Either water flows out, the pump grabbed dry running, or some other problems may occur. In general, lots of problems have a chance to occur. Therefore, how to do it right? Firstly, try to install the pump under the water intake, if it's not self-priming. That means below the water surface. Then it will always be filled with water. If it's empty, it just won't even start if water comes out of it. And if you install the pump above the water level, you can do that too. Then be sure to put a check valve, a pedal-type valve, for the water intake, so it will slam, shut, and not let water just leak out of the pipes when the pump stops. Second rule, install a faucet on the suction, to shut it off if necessary. That is, at the take you install the check valve in case the pump and the faucet are above the water level. Next, what do you need for the pressure pipe? The first is a check valve. Yes, another one. I definitely recommend it. If there is no at the suction, it's definitely necessary. It will slam in the event that you stop the pump, which will not allow to empty the pipeline. After that, install another valve, which will also be closed when you turn off the pump. And the last thing you need in the pressure line is a pressure gauge, which will measure the actual pressure in the pipeline, which is created by the pump. You can use it to understand the pump flow, whether the pump is alright and is operating well and so on. And further, I will tell you about fourth common mistake, which is regularly committed. It's the wrong pump piping. It may happen when you do not put check valves. When you stop the pump water hammer effect, may happen as lots of other problems. Do according the classic way, like grandfathers in my country did. Nothing has changed in this regard. 
change only the pipeline fittings. So do it this way. It's more or less the same approach in my country. Pipelines. You will not only need to properly install and tie the pump, you will also need to ensure that the water is pumped to the final destination, to the fish tanks. This is done as a rule by means of pipelines. Of course, there are also canal systems, but we don't take them into consideration now. We consider only pipe systems. What is important in this case? First of all, it's important to choose the right diameter of the pipeline. And how can the right diameter is selected? It's very simple. And by the way, here lies another common mistake. In most cases, a wrong diameter is selected, large resistance is created, the pump doesn't perform optimally, and so on. In order for the pump to work properly, I recommend to use the golden rule. Provide the speed of water in the pipe from 1.5 to 2.5 meters per second. Water is forced under pressure after the pump. Only then the resistance will be minimal. The parameters will be adequate and there will be no pipes of too large diameters used in vain. In general, everything will work well. And that's the fifth typical mistake. The fact is that each pump has a certain diameter of the inlet and outlet, the section manifold, the pressure collector. So, unknowingly, many farmers select the diameter of the pipes exactly corresponding to the diameter of the pump inlet. And why not? If the pump inlet is such, then probably it should be fine, but not really so. Because the diameter of the pump inlet and the diameter of the pipeline, by and large, have nothing to do with each other. And you need to pick up the diameter of the pipe by the water flow rate. So be careful. Usually, the outlet of the pump is about 30% smaller in diameter than the actual pipe diameter should be for the correct velocity, resistance, pressure calculations. For example, the pump may have the outlet of 70 cm and you put the collector of 100 cm. Everything is calculated by the simplest elementary formula 1.5 to 2.5 meters per second water velocity. Frequency control. I really consider this approach very efficient as it allows you to save energy. Imagine you have a farm where the maximum water exchange is 100 cubic meters per hour, and now the farm is stocked by only 10% of the maximum farm capacity. Accordingly, you don't need such an intensive water exchange. The fish have enough oxygen, there is little dirt in the tanks. Why do you need excessive energy consumption? You can provide a frequency converter, which will reduce the frequency of the pump impeller rotation. You can just reduce power consumption of the pump and save your money. So put frequency converters, if you have one to two running pumps, in order to reduce the speed and consequently the power consumption, and spend less money. But another important point I would like to underline is pump redundancy. You have just one pump for the entire system. Sooner or later it's bound to fail. High-quality equipment lasts a long time. Bad equipment breaks down quickly. But the fact is, sooner or later everything breaks down. Therefore, since pumping water is one of the main functions of any rest system, and if the pumping stops, the fish will die, so be sure to provide for backup pumps. If you have just one operating pump, necessarily provide for one backup unit and connect two pumps, operating and backup, together. If you have two pumps installed at the farm, it's advisable to put a third backup. Well, if you have three operating units working in parallel, in principle, you may stop installing backup pumps, because if one breaks, you will lose 30-35% of the total water exchange. Nothing critical will happen. Therefore, if you have one or two operating pumps, make sure you have a backup unit. So, today we talked about the pumps. We discussed what they are, what types, what brands exist, what they are in terms of reliability, how to choose the right pump by the flow, the head, where to install the pump, how to strap the pipes. I hope that this was helpful to you. And if it is, press the like button and subscribe to my channel. It's Anton Pelcher and my channel on how to grow fish and make good money from it. Bye.